Hello, I'm John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart audio podcast. For more information on Ransomed Heart Ministries, our resources and events, please visit us online at www.ransomedheart.com. Hello, I'm a Mac, and I'm a PC. (laughs) I'm John Eldridge, and this is Craig McConnell. Mm. And uh, welcome back to the Ransomed Heart podcast. I'm referring to an Apple commercial that uh, I think is absolutely brilliant. It's those whole series of commercials of the really cool, hip, laid back, postmodern guy uh, set up to the office manager of the 1980s, the bumbling idiot. Oh, my goodness. Just how clear those commercials are on what influences people. It's not substance. It's not content. It's who's hip, who's not, who do you want to be identified with? And friends, as we continue a conversation about how did Jesus look at government, we're, we're so aware. We're right on the edge of you know an election cycle here. And when we began this series, um, one of the things we said was we talked about moral equivalency. We talked about how... Um, The Bible does not teach that all issues are equally weighty, not all issues are equally profound or should merit the same kind of concern. And so um, we want to hit on, you know, some important things here regarding government. But I think the first one I I have to say is um, you can't choose your party or your candidate based on a handful of pet positions. You know, what's happening to the rainforest is important. It really is. I actually, I'm an environmentalist and I give to those causes, but it's not nearly as important as human life. Mm-hmm. What's happening in education, I think is really important, but it's not as important as what's happening in sexuality, marriage, and gender issues. Those are mm-hmm. far more crucial and core. So, you you know, you have you have moral issues that the government has now gotten into and those are not all equal. And so as we kind of weigh into these things, I felt like I wanted to just start with with that. Which brings me to a question, Craig. What is the role of government? What should we look for it to provide and what shouldn't we look for it to provide? Gee, you caught me off guard by that question. Just uh, so simple. Um, I think government's role is um, to protect its citizens against evil and violence. It's to be um, a protector of the peace and of overseeing kind of the kingdom or its rule or reign from invaders, whether they be other foreign countries or from within. I think it's primarily one of protection. Yeah, I'm thinking of Romans 13, where Paul is saying, look, God ordained government. It's important. And it says he's God's servant, okay, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Okay, so that's pretty clear. Issues of justice administration on criminals. Also, it says, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. So, right, protection of evil, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. What else? Or what is it not? Yeah. Maybe more to the point. Yeah, I don't think government is um, our source of life. I don't think government is our source of ultimately of hope. Um, I don't think government can provide what the human soul and what the human body and spirit ultimately needs. It cannot play the role of God. And there is a role God plays as our provider that uh, we can put on government or expect government to to play when we've lost uh, connection with God, the provider. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was, I was struck by a passage in John chapter 6 um, last week as I was just reading personally in the morning. And, and uh, you know, the crowd's asking Jesus for a miracle because he, he fed the 5,000 and they want another free lunch. And, and Jesus says, uh, you know, they say, look, we need to see a miracle. Moses gave them bread from heaven. And then John 6, 32, I love how Jesus says this. He says, oh, I can assure you, it was not Moses 
who gave them bread from heaven, but my father. Okay, mm-hmm. so he's even just trying to correct their expectations of that wasn't Moses. Mm-hmm. You're looking to the wrong source here. It was God who provided the manna from heaven. And I, and I thought, you know, that's really important in a time where, again, I think many naive Uh, Though good-hearted Christian people are looking to the government to provide them with manna and and to say, whoa, 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 it's not Moses and it's not Obama. Mm -hmm. You know, it is not the king that provides you with manna from heaven. There are some things government should do and when it fails to do them, it breaks down. Administration of justice being one of them. National defense being another, very clear in Scripture, does not bear the sword for nothing. God gave governments the sword, but it didn't give you know, the government the spatula, mm-hmm. right, or the soup spoon. Yeah. It didn't give government the diaper pen, yeah. you know, for another example of kind of looking to government uh, to take care of our children. And you just want to go, whoa, 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 are you kidding me? Do you know what you're doing? You, The more that you look to government to provide your personal needs – the more you surrender yourself to that government. And then friends, I mean, you start surrendering massive amounts of your personal um, liberties, values, convictions, because you're hoping that the government's going to come through for you in ways that it was never designed to. How about the resolution of justice? How about that whole issue? I know you're kind of passionate on that one. Is that the role of government? Well, on justice, John, yeah, I think a kind of a naive uh, understanding of Scripture that the justice that we rightfully perhaps fight for and advocate for in the workplace and in the world and in economies and so on and so forth is um, achievable to a greater degree on this earth than is actually ever really possible. I think – I think heaven is so written in our hearts and, and what will be often gets misinterpreted as what should be currently and now that a lot of, uh, a lot of the passion behind fighting for justice um, is misplaced in its timing, thinking that governments can provide it. And uh, my reading of scripture is that uh, governments, while perhaps charged with bringing justice and protection and promoting goodness over a community are limited in their ability to deliver or maintain it. And we live in a world, frankly, where um, we shouldn't be caught off guard or surprised if, as we've covered in other uh, segments of this conversation with injustice, with sin, with brokenness, with people disappointing us, with things failing, becoming corrupted. And it goes back to the your opening comments. I mean, what's the story? Are we living in some larger story or a good but smaller story? And I, I think there's there's something larger than trying to establish heaven on earth against impossible odds and against the timing of God. Heaven is yet future, something to come. Yes, yes. Here's a way that that kind of naivete can express itself. Again, there's just no way of avoiding really emotional issues. Um, Therefore, if we look to government to provide a kind of kingdom of of God here on earth, you know, the peaceable kingdom, gun control type issues, you know, well, as the saying goes, you know, if you make carrying guns criminal and only criminals will carry guns, you know, you you take away the right of citizens to bear arms, you know, obviously Mm -hmm. a constitutional right. And with the idea that that is going to stop violence. And that's just such a naive view. Are you kidding me? People will then use rocks for violence. They'll use telephone poles. They'll use what, you know, electrical cords for violence. Are you kidding me that this idea that that we can bring about a peaceable kingdom by laying down arms, which is hearkening back to our pacifist broadcast, is just a really naive view that... um, you know, there are limited ends to which government can be helpful. And beyond that, particularly, I think, in the realm of social services or issues of reconciliation mm-hmm. or the health of marriages. You know, when you have government involved in marriage counseling, you know, when you, when you start inserting government into uh, parenting issues, et cetera, you are surrendering massive realms uh, that God intended either for the family or for the church 
to administrate to the government, and there goes your, there goes your liberties, friends. Yes. So, yeah. in other words, there's a naivete of wow, if we'll just surrender everything over to this particular party or this particular government, you know, they'll bring about the kind of world or life we want on Earth, and it ain't going to happen, friends. It no. is. It's not going to happen. And actually, I think it moves from a political posture into an idolatry. I, I think it just becomes just a, a, a subtle rejection of God and a turning to to the kingdom of man, to the kingdoms of this world, for something that only God can provide. And so, yes, I think one of the things we're saying, friends, is that, of course, your choices are between the lesser of two evils. Of course they are. No candidate's perfect. No party is perfect. No policy is perfect. You've just got to be very careful what you're putting your hopes in. And when, when we kind of reach for too much, again, I think the history of communism being that, that you know the promises were incredibly lofty and they were actually embraced by a number of Christian people that you know we're going to raise the status of the oppressed and we're going to bring down the oppressor. And I mean, it all sounds like Old Testament prophet stuff. And we're going to advocate for the poor and the, and the average man on the street. But then you look at the actual track record of it and it was devastating. Yes. It was absolutely devastating. There is no historical evidence whatsoever that the communist ideal is a good form of government. Yes. And part of the reason for that is you looked for it to do too many things for you. Mm -hmm. You surrendered a massive amount of personal liberties in hopes that the government would be your all in all. Absolutely devastating. And I think what we're saying is, gang, you know, smelling salts, wake up, you know, smell the coffee. Like, be very careful what you are looking to your government to provide or your candidate. And as Jesus called Herod that fox, I mean, you have to have a healthy realism here. And then also we're trying to kind of recover something of a biblical view of the role of government, and it is very limited. You know, you don't see government in the role of the church. Yes. You see a separation of kingdoms. You see a limited role, you know, in the administration of justice and protection and, and you know, the punishment of criminals. But beyond that, friends, be careful what you're looking to your government to provide. Yeah, on that, be careful. And, and Herod being referred to as a fox, John, I mean, one of the biblical just realities is things are not as they appear. And when it comes to elections and voting and choosing leaders and so on and so forth, I, I mean, um, uh, their policy or the substance of what they're uh, promoting or promising or speaking to over personality is just huge. It's just amazing to me that so many people are judging a candidate or a, uh, a position by its spokespeople. Yeah, I I'm, mean, a, I'm ah, a Mac, I'm yeah, a PC. Yeah, yeah. You've got some guy who made a million movies who looks good and comes out and says, vote this way, and people just go, well, if he's voting that way, I will. And you think... Does anyone stop and scratch the surface and go, really? You've got to put policy or substance over personality or charisma. Yeah, John, uh, we're not advocating theocracy. Um, that's just not possible. But I go back to uh, Samuel when uh, he was confronted by um, the people of God wanting a king like all the other nations. Uh, that pressure to be like others. And uh, Samuel, it says in First Samuel chapter 8, um, verse 11, Samuel says that um, um, this will be the procedure of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons, place them for himself in his chariots and among his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and fifties and some to do the plowing and to reap the harvest and make weapons of war and equipment. He will take your daughters for perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and some of your vineyards, your olive groves, and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers. He will take your male servants and your female servants and your best young men and your donkeys and use them for his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his servants. And then you'll cry out in that day because of your king whom you've chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not hear you. And it's just the 
just do you realize the expense and the cost of looking to a king or to a government to be your god? It's costly. It's going to cost everything. Craig, um, two shows barely seems like enough on how does Jesus look at government. I mean, we're just scratching the surface. But hopefully this gives some categories to people to begin to think about these things in. Yeah. I think the cumulative effect of this series, John, is simply that as I'm sitting here, I'm just realizing there there is an area, a topic, a subject of life, day-to-day living in, in all our relationships and circumstances uh, that we don't find ourselves in a posture of looking to God for how should I live? Um, How do I respond? What do I interpret or think of this? How should I vote? What should I choose? Um, There's just no exemption in life in any area from bringing God and what he says into it. And Jesus says, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I mean, friends, to to find out Jesus' convictions on on this, that, or the other thing is life. It's a relief. It's, you know, it, it may be a little embarrassing when you realize that, oops, other things have been shaping me. But, Lord, please speak, reveal. I want to know what you think about this. It's life. As Peter said, where else are we going to go, Lord? Where else are we going to go? Jesus, you alone have the words of life. And so that's the spirit that we mm-hmm. offer all of this in And we pray, um, as we close today's broadcast, we pray, Jesus, continue to just expose what I believe and where, where I got it from. Come, I invite you to search me, know me, as the Psalms say, and uh, lead me in truth. Lead me, Jesus, to your way of looking at things. I want a life that is really in alignment with yours in everything, my sexuality, what I eat, the way I relate to others, and here, in government, Lord, show me, speak. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Okay, friends, we're actually going to continue on with some other topics next time on how did Jesus just look at different things. So thanks for joining us. This has been the Ransomed Heart Podcast with John Eldridge and Craig McConnell. 